What's up, Meta-Nerds? This breakdown will have us looking under the Exo Shell armor to see how everything worked, its history, and end with behind-the-scenes facts pulling from all these different resources to fully understand the TX-130 Saber Tank. While the Separatist AAT was battle-hardened for more than a decade before the Battle of Geonosis, the TX-130 would not hit the battlefront until some months after the war. Manufactured by Rathana Heavy Engineering, the subsidiary of Kuat Drive Yards, that created everything from the Acclimator to ATTE and would later produce the Onager class Star Destroyer and TX-225 tank. While the ATTE was performing even better than expected, the generals realized that this only operated in a heavy tank role, and there was a need for a fast response and attack armor that would still be deadly against tanks and softer targets, but giving up the ability to punch through deflector shields, fortress walls, or level entire mountains in exchange for speed. Hitting a top speed of 320 km per hour is part of why it was dubbed the Jedi Starfighter of the Ground, as this was nearly six times faster than its main enemy, the AAT, and its brother, the ATTE, definitely meeting the design requirements. But that is its boost speed, which admittedly only lasts a few seconds, great for avoiding attacks or closing a gap in an ambush, but even its cruising speed of 193 km per hour is nearly four times the other tanks. With a small profile at a length of 8.2 meters, height of 2.3 meters, and a width of 3.05 meters, making it about half the length of the ATTE, as well as half its height, and 60% the width. And while it's true that mass production of this tank wasn't ready at the start of the war like the LAATs or other Republic ships and vehicles, there were prototypes made intended to be fielded when the war eventually kicked off and to be piloted by Jedi to get real-world feedback on the tank design. These are the TX-130s used by Mace Windu and Ayla Sakura during the first Battle of Geonosis, being delivered to the surface via LAATC, or carriers, and they were able to put its power and speed to brilliant use. These prototypes will go on to see heavy use during the next series of battles to Renvar, to Raxus Prime, and then on to Thul and Seleucami. With the high praise of the Jedi and elite clone forces, Rathana went into overdrive to get these saber tanks onto battlefronts all across the galaxy. So let's look at the official schematic to see how it all worked. Getting the saddest part out of the way first, the clone gunner up top is, quote, usually the lowest ranking trooper because he is exposed to the most hazardous battle conditions. A coldness that sounds like something Grievous would say about his droids, but safely behind the armor was the tank pilot slash commander, which was a Jedi at first and then later high ranking clone specialists. He is surrounded by panels that provide all sorts of battlefront terrain data, locations of allied troops and mission objectives, and targeting data for each of the weapons with a radar system located right below that medium laser cannon, and a pair of comm and telemetry antennas that all bring data to the main computer CPU located under this nose armor, with a series of backup CPUs lining this section. The cockpit is accessed via this quick release door towards the rear, like we see in the AAT, and also like its droid army rival, it utilizes a series of batteries put into a big series and wrapped around a coil to create a powerful charge for the laser cannons with a motor to raise and lower the guns to hit ground targets and even shoot down some enemy transports. These are heavy rated laser cannons and are so strong that they slapped a muzzle suppressor on it and have gas powered dampening systems to counteract the recoil force when those lasers are fired. There are six fuel cells that are mounted in a heavily armored fuel bay underneath its main hull, providing it with an operational range of 400 kilometers before needing to refuel, either at a base or to be whisked away by an LAATC up into an acclimator or venator. The way that it lifts off the ground and floats is via the massive repulsor field generator, with the exchange conduit injecting raw fuel into the repulsor lifts at high pressure to provide that turbocharged boost. While the standard repulsor lift units are here, and the magna coils that amplify everything are all throughout this base, requiring Rathana to develop new heat sinks for all their repulsor and boosting tech. All this power and speed meant that these systems created more heat than Mustafar down there, but specially sheathed heat sinks cool the engine and help radiate heat away. Luckily, the advanced armor system is strong but relatively lightweight. By laminating high tensile strength materials in a prototype carbon strand weave pattern, nearly every inch of this tank is covered in this carbon laminate process, with this entire front section being double laminated. The AAT simply added thick sections of solid durasteel, which mostly did the job and fit their style of being easy to produce for their simple ships and vehicles, but the Sabre tank only cost 10k more at 85,000 credits. And it includes a deflector shield generator, called the Phase 3 Exoshell Deflector Shield Generator System. It was the first one to be installed in a ground vehicle. The AAT cannot penetrate this shield, but the only catch is that these shield generator power cells up front aren't large enough to leave this shielding permanently on, like we might see in a capital ship. So when the shield was recharging, it had to rely on the reactive armor, shedding off layers of this carbon laminate with each blow. 
but most clones were confident in its offensive capabilities, being able to take out enemy tanks with its variable munition launchers, one on each side for a total of 16 to 20 concussion missiles on board, which could also be filled with cluster thermal detonator bombs or other explosive ordnance, all packed into these sections, which are hard to get a direct hit on if it's facing the enemy. This sloped, double-armored section up front would either deflect or eat the incoming blast. In fact, no crucial weapon or energy system is up front in these sections, unlike the AAT, which we saw had devastating failures, perhaps due to the weakness of that front hatch and those side blaster cannons. Let me thank this video's sponsor, World of Tanks. This is a free-to-play game that I know a lot of you meta nerds already love, and they have 100 million players worldwide for PC. I've seen comments mentioning this game for a while. It's an excellent warfare game, and specifically for you tank sim fans out there. There were more than 600 tanks in the form of destroyers, artillery, light, medium, and heavy tanks, meaning there is always a fun new playstyle and unique challenge as you slug it out over diverse terrain, from forests, fields, deserts, to cities, across over 40 different arenas. It's intense gameplay, but also renowned for the historical accuracy, with each tank being based on real models and operating with their real-world characteristics. And the more you win, the more you unlock, meaning you can modify and upgrade these tanks in your collection. So be sure to check it out. Again, it's free to play and one of those games I've been hearing praises for for a while. Use that link in the description, and during your registration, use the code TANKMANIA for your free 7 days premium account, 250,000 credits, the premium tank Excelsior, which is tier 5, and three rental tanks for 10 battles each. The Tiger 131, Tier 6, Cromwell B, also Tier 6, and the T-34-85M, another Tier 6 tank. All for free by using that link down in the description. I'm sure you're going to have fun with World of Tanks, so thanks again for sponsoring this video. Some other cool features are that the Repulsor engine lock lets it turn on a dime like a tank with treads, but this feature isn't used that often. These stabilizer wings are something you'd normally only see in Starfighters, and really add to that nickname, the Jedi Starfighter of the Ground. There are these towing fixtures up front, which show that this vehicle could be used in a support role to free allies from difficult terrain, but also on the offensive for pulling down walls or clearing out obstacles. And this gunner turret is not standard on all of them. They seem to be retired from the middle to later parts of the war, perhaps seeing how many clones were dying up there, and some would replace this whole section with an astromech socket. These versions were as close to a starfighter as you could get. And since everything inside could be done with a single pilot, the R2 unit just helped with calculating the best routes on the battlefield, slicing into enemy comms, and adding in targeting data by finding weaknesses in an enemy position or vehicle. And this last point is a bit of speculation over this single line saying, interchangeable engines, which reminded me of how the AAT reloads its rockets and gets fresh armor up front by detaching this entire foot section. So since most of the fuel and power systems are on this bottom layer, I could see the Sabre tank being modular too, with this whole bottom part separating at a Republic base. Refueling the missiles on the side would be easy and modular either way, but I'd imagine the heat and complex prototype power systems would be finicky. I think it's plausible that this whole section could be removed. There was also the S variant that had upgraded targeting systems and allowed it to use its heavy guns and missiles at a much greater distance, acting like a sniping tank or artillery, while the T was larger, able to carry 5 troops inside and 100 kilograms of cargo, with larger fuel tanks and meant to work in a scout role. These were only fielded in the final year of the Clone Wars, 19 BBY, on the battlefronts across Megiddo, Kashyyyk, Naboo, and Yavin 4. All the Jedi were known to use this like a Delta 7, calling on their Force abilities to pull out an even greater agility and maneuvers, and it was loved by clone troopers and Republic allies, but for how great it was, the Sabre tank was relatively short-lived. All production stopped as soon as the Empire declared this new era of peace. But at least they didn't scrap them all. Many lived on until they had maintenance problems, and its descendants would live on for decades. Specifically, the TX-130Ts would live on the longest into this Imperial era, used famously during the Battle of New Plimto, where Order 66 survivors were hunted down and the local resistance population was systematically executed. The Nasorians were able to hold off even the Empire's mighty new AT-AT walker, hiding out in steep jungle cliffsides, where the battle finally got bogged down, and it looked like it might be a powerful morale victory for the burgeoning resistance movement. Until the TX-130Ts arrived. Their smaller size and great speed were able to pursue the rebels into the terrain that was inaccessible to the walkers. And the tank's firepower, armor, and shields meant it could easily take everything the Nasorians threw at them. And with the tank's five trooper capacity, when the tanks finally couldn't pursue, each could release a squad of still battle-hardened Imperial clone troopers. After a month of brutal fighting, the tanks would force a surrender, and what was intended to be a morale boost for rebels across the galaxy was turned into a threat and example by Emperor Palpatine, with the 501st executing all the surrendering survivors, and anyone else found alive across the planet were summarily turned into slaves and sent off to Orvax 4. 
Though the rebels would capture some during the Battle of Turek IV, and then over the course of the Galactic Civil War, there was always a handful of them that fell into the hands of Rebel Alliance and other resistance movements, they never seemed to be used in any major Rebel victories, perhaps due to the complex nature of the tank making it difficult to operate, and the high level of maintenance. Or they were taken out by one of its many successors. Or even the up-armored Imperial Assault Tank, which is what the Empire did with all the AATs left from the Separatist side. The 2M Saber Repulsor Tank was the most similar, with no qualitative difference from arms to armor, it even kept a shield. And with this one, we do get explicit complaints about it breaking down all the time. This model branched off to the Scout Class 2M, which was shortened overall and made more like a heavy speeder than a tank. With this open top, and apparently was used on some icy worlds with snowtroopers. The Imperial Repulsor Tank 1H would be produced by Abrikian Industries and was cheaper at 50k, but had a similar speed and impressive armament. There were high hopes for this tank, and 80 of them were given to the Imperial Hammer's Elite Armor Unit, aka Hell's Hammer. But all of the rest of them ever produced, 1,420 of the 1,500 made in total, were assigned to patrol the first Death Star. A funny idea not explored too often is that there were enormous sections of this moon-sized battle station that had entire tank battalions for defense, and all of them were destroyed that fateful day. With this loss, the S1 Firehawk was produced, and all of these went to that same group, Hell's Hammer. And this tank could hit an insane 400 km per hour top speed, but there isn't much else known about it. But this last addition, also primarily to Hell's Hammer, was the TX-225. The GAVR was for Repulsor, and the GAVW was for Wheeled Treads, but each had a drastically reduced speed down to just 72 km per hour. It lost that heavy laser cannon and missiles, but in this time of fighting rebels, not the CIS military, the twin medium cannons were almost always powerful enough. And an interesting detail is that the armor is still using that composite laminate method, but now they're working in depleted duranium, which is stronger than the durasteel used in most ships and vehicles, and is what was used in Grievous's cybernetic skeleton. It was incredibly hard to work, but laying it out in flat strips and panels did make the TX-225 armor even greater than the 130. The ones deployed the Jetta were part of the notorious Hammer's Elite Armor Unit. While a thermal detonator takes out the treads, later it is this one chucked underneath that finally sets it all off with the 225 likely having many crucial systems down below like in the Saber Tank. And all throughout this Rebel era, each of these variants would fall into enemy hands, often painted with red Rebel colors, as well as the countless opportunists in the form of criminals and mercenary groups that looted the battlefront for the latest military weaponry. So that's it for the breakdown, and as for behind the scenes facts, its first appearance was in the Clone Wars video game, with this cross section being in the instruction booklet that came in the game case. It's so sad that we lose stuff like this with modern gaming. A lot of the other info came from the Star Wars Legion game with their fighter tank unit expansion, and the Clone Wars campaign guide for tabletop RPG, and of course its depiction in Battlefront. Well, it even gets a mention in the novelization of Revenge of the Sith. If you like this, I'm sure you'll like our ships and vehicles playlists. There's also a ton of the different military factions, so be sure to check all those out. Like, comment, share, and subscribe, all that stuff helps me out. But most important of all, remember, if you aren't shown on screen in the movies, you're probably one of the cooler aspects of Star Wars lore and the Force will be with you, always.